Hello, and welcome back to Phil 320 Deductive Logic. I'm Professor Matthew Brown, and this is the second in our series of lectures for Unit 7, where we're going to talk about translations and proofs in QL. So what we're doing here is we're just combining the skills we learned back in Unit 5, Chapter 4 of the book, where we did translations to QL, um, with our proof strategies, right? And um, so let's get straight into it with some examples. I want you to take each of these three English language arguments, and I want you to translate it into QL and provide a proof. I want you to do this, pause the video and do this for all three arguments. I've provided there uh, a sort of abbreviated symbolization key for the different predicates and constants that you'll use for each of these arguments, okay? So pause the video, give it a go, come back when you think you have it. All right, welcome back. Let's see how you did. First, um, let's start with number one. Our argument is oranges are sweet. We're using O for orange and S is for sweet. Also, oranges are fragrant. We're using F for fragrant. Therefore, oranges are sweet and fragrant. So this is how I would translate this argument. Um, oranges are sweet. Um, which is uh, unqualified. It's not some oranges are sweet. It's all oranges are sweet. All oranges are fragrant. Therefore, all oranges are sweet and fragrant, right? Um, for all X, if it's an orange, then it is sweet and fragrant, right? Now let's head over to Carnap and see if we can prove this argument. So here we are. We've got the two premises loaded up already. Let's see if we can get our conclusion. Here I am going to use the conjunction introduction rule to, to get us what, I, what we want to get. But before I do that, I am going to go ahead and get some substitution instances of our first and second premise. Let's use, let's use lowercase o as our constant. So um, OO then SO is a substitution instance of one. So we can apply our universal elimination rule there. OO then FO for premise two. Okay, now we're going to do a conditional introduction. We're gonna start by assuming OO, right? And this assumption we wanna to get to SO and FO. That's where we're trying to get. So I can get SO through conditional elimination, three and five. I can get FO the same way on four and five. I can get SO and FO through conjunction introduction on line six and seven. That's what I wanted to get. So I can close out my subproof. I have if OO, then SO and FO. That is conditional introduction on lines five through eight. But I don't want just that, I want the universal. And because I picked O arbitrarily at random, when I started out on lines three and four, I can get it back by using the universal introduction, OX, then SX and FX. Here, that's universal introduction on line nine. That gets me where I wanna go. Did you get to the same place? I hope that you did, but let me know if you have any questions. Let's move on to our second argument, which is this one. All gardeners are industrious. Furthermore, anyone industrious is respected. Arthur and Catherine are gardeners, so they are both respected. I'm using G here for gardeners, I for industrious, R for respected, and lowercase a for Arthur, lowercase c for Catherine. So let's see. Um, all gardeners are industrious. That's fairly straightforward, universal. So is anyone industrious is respected, right? That is all industrious ones are respected ones. Arthur's a gardener and Catherine's a gardener, GA and GC. Therefore, Arthur is respected and Catherine is respected. Let's head over to Carnap and try to prove this one. So here we go. I've loaded the premises in already, and we want to get to RA and RC. I'm going to use here my universal elimination rules again. 
I need G A then I A, right? That's universal elimination on line one. And I need I A then R A, that's universal elimination on line two. Okay, next, in order to apply these conditionals, I need the antecedent, I need G A, right? Which I can get through conjunction elimination on line three. Now I can get I A through conditional elimination on line four and six. I can get R A through conditional elimination on line five and seven. And I've got R A, that's half the battle. Now, I'm gonna have to do this all over again to get R C, but I know how to do it now. I'm actually gonna copy and paste all those steps. I'm gonna replace the A with a C, so far so good. To get RC, I'm gonna to have to change the line numbers here to 10 and 12. And my last move here is to get RA and RC through conjunction, introduction on line eight, where RA is, and line 13, where RC is. And that is done. Let's go ahead and look at our third argument, which is the longest one we have. So if all the artichokes in the kitchen are ripe, then the guests will be surprised. Furthermore, if the artichokes in the kitchen are flavorful, then all the guests will be pleased. All the artichokes in the kitchen are ripe and flavorful, therefore the guests will be surprised and pleased. These are kind of complicated because you have a universal in that first line, all the artichokes in the kitchen are ripe, but that's embedded in a conditional. So I would represent that like this, right? We have for all X, if X is in artichoke and X is in the kitchen, that's all the artichokes in the kitchen, then X is ripe, right? All the artichokes in the kitchen are ripe. If that's true, then all the guests will be surprised, okay? So that's how I would represent that first premise. Our second premise is similar, right? All the artichokes in the kitchen are flavorful, and if that's true, then all the guests will be pleased. And finally, all the artichokes in the kitchen are ripe and flavorful, right? That is, for all X, if X is an artichoke in the kitchen, then X is ripe and flavorful. Therefore, all the guests will be surprised and pleased. So that's how I would represent that argument. Let's see if we can head over to Carnap and prove it. So here we are, we've got the premises loaded up again, and we're trying to get to that final uh, universal, all the guests will be surprised and pleased. Now this is a complicated one, but what I'm seeing here is a series of conditionals that I'm gonna need to um, break down. I'm gonna start by trying to break down this third premise, um, which has the universal quantifier in it with the universal elimination rule. So let's say um, we're gonna use um, A, AA -A and KA. If AA -A and KA, then RA and FA, right? I'm doing this universal elimination because I think it is going to help me get the antecedents of my two conditional arguments here. That's my guess. So let's see. The antecedent of the conditional in one just has RA in it. So I need to get something that looks like that. I'm going to try to use the conditional introduction rule on AA and KA. And what I want is RA. Right, so I can use this and the conditional elimination rule to get RA and FA, conditional elimination for five. I can get RA, right, through uh, conjunction elimination on line six. That's what I wanted to get. So now I have AA and KA, then RA, right? That's conditional introduction on my subgroup five through seven. And that allows me, because A was chosen at random in line four uh, and doesn't appear in any premise or undischarged assumption, 
I can use the universal introduction rule to get um, for all x, ax, and kx, then rx through the universal introduction on line eight. That is the antecedent of my line one, right? Um, which will allow me to get for all y, gy, then sy through conditional elimination, one and nine. Great. Now I need to do all of those steps again, but uh, just changing out the relevant um, pieces, right? So I'm gonna copy and paste here to make this go a little faster. Of course, it's gonna mess some things up, so I have to think through what exactly I'm getting. Uh, a, A, and K, A, yes. R, A, and F, A, yes, except this is line 11 now, right? But what I wanna get now is not R, A, but F, A, right? So I'm changing this to line 12. I want um, F, A here. So my line numbers are changing. This is the subproof of 11 through 13. So far, so good. Here we're doing to FX and change this to 14, good. And here we're changing this to PY, which is what appears in the conditional on line two. And if I use 15 here, I get that. Okay, we've come a long way, um, but we're not there yet. I've got these two universals on line 10 and 16, but what I want, remember, is this more complex one here. So I know that I can do it through a conditional introduction, but I'm gonna need first to introduce a substitution instance. So let's call, uh, let's use a different constant. Let's use G, GG, then SG. That's universal elimination on line 10, substituting the Y with a G. I can also get G, G, then PG, universal elimination on line 16. Now I can do my conditional introduction. Assume GG, Y, because I want, to get SG and PG, right? That's my goal here. I get SG through conditional elimination, 17, 19. I get PG, conditional elimination, 18, 19. I get SG and PG through conjunction introduction, 2021. 20, and that is what I wanted to get. So now I can close out my subproof with this conditional introduction here, conditional introduction 19 to 22, and that has the right form. I just have to apply my universal introduction to the conditional here, get SY and PY, and that is universal introduction 23. I can use the universal introduction here again because G was chosen at random, doesn't appear in a premise, and doesn't appear in any undischarged assumption up above. Well, that was a big one. I hope it gives you a, a better sense of how to do some more complex proofs in QL. All right. Um, so uh, give those. Uh, kinds of problems in the practice exercises a go. You will have to do some translation and proof work on the exam. So um, you wanna make sure that you have that down pat. Um, I will see you next time where we put together the ideas from this unit seven with the ideas on semantics from our last unit six um, to uh, look at how to combine work with proofs and models to accomplish a variety of tasks. Good luck on the practice exercises. I will see you next time.